2 Timothy 3, verses 12 through 17. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from uh, childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith which is in Jesus or Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The book of Jude is really similar to the letter that Timothy, uh, to the letter of Timothy, warning us of the dangers concerning our faith and how to hold on to what has been given to us. Jude gives us a warning. It's a negative message because of the false prophets, the false people, the, the really the kind of people that are we would consider wolves in sheep's clothing that have kind of infiltrated the fellowship. And originally, he was trying to give a message of encouragement about how great the salvation is that we have. But the Holy Spirit said, now we really kind of need you to give a warning about the dangers of the imposters and the people that had come in through that silly back door. Second Timothy tells us that scripture is really important for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. And we need the word of God, not only for the positive things, but also for the negative so that we don't find ourselves behaving in ways that Jude has been pointing out. Over the last several weeks, we've looked at Jude 11, where he talked about uh, the Old Testament uh, examples of Cain, Balaam, and uh, Korah. He gave three different examples so that we don't, don't find ourselves behaving like them, but not just that, but it gives us a chance to open our eyes and be aware of what is actually out there. Jude gives us an examples in threes. And in the next two verses, he's going to give examples from nature, which is going to add to the characteristics of what he's already given from nature. And it's supposed to help us to be able to identify any false apostates or teachers that can be among us, even in today's times. Jude one twelve. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Now, the word for hidden reefs is uh, uh, spilas, and it's literally a hidden reef. Now, what is a hidden reef? Well, it's something that's under the water, fully under the water. It could be a reef, it could be rocks, it could be trees, it could be anything that is under the water that you do not want to come across while you're in a boat, period. When I remember this uh, example that he gave right here, the first thing that came to mind, whether you like them or not, or enjoy the movie or not, is on Golden Pond. <laughs> ah, you see, I'm not, I may not be a big fan of Hanoi Jane, but I do like Henry, and I do like uh, Catherine Hepburn, and I do kind of like Gabney Coleman. He plays some really, really weird parts. But I thought when I read this and I read all about these hidden reefs, it came to mind on Golden Pond, and there's Norman. <laughs> there's Norman out on the boat, with Billy. And they're in an uncharted area and it's getting dark and the weather's not the greatest. So he looks at, at, at Billy and he goes, can you drive the boat? And he goes, well, yeah, I can do it. And so Billy the kid is driving the boat and here's Norman on the front. And he's leaning over and he's looking at for the different hidden things. And he's going this way, this way. 
And he's going along and things are going great. They're going, you know, that, and it's that beautiful boat. Oh my gosh, those are my favorite types of boats in the whole world. Them old fashioned ones from the 20s and 30s and 40s. The ones that G Leroy Jethro Gibbs drove and then blew up in the last, oh, made me cry. But here he is and all of a sudden, Norman looks and he goes, reverse. And Billy goes, boop, and hits forward really fast and they hit the sudden rocks. And Norman goes flying off and he busts his head open and Billy in the boat sinks. And they're stuck in the water for a very long time. And then I think, I'm trying to remember if it's the park ranger or if it's a, a one of the water people. They came out there and they found them and they were able to tow the boat back. And then they got grounded. <laughs> she would not let Norman and Billy go back out on the boat. You must fish from the shore. Well, we all know the end of that story. They did not pay attention. And they were able to catch the big fish that they've been trying to catch forever, Walter. Now see, it's the same situation. If you've got a sailor and he's on, his, on the front of the boat and he's dropping and he's marking the stuff, the fathoms, and he's supposed to be there watching for the things under the water so that the ship does not hit it. If he's not paying attention and they hit something that's under the water, it could wreck and sink a ship full of precious cargo. And in those days, that was a bad thing because boats were really kind of hard to come by. And that's how these people are. They're like the hidden rocks under the water. They can shipwreck those people that are in the congregations today and back then. They could shipwreck that congregation and destroy the faith. And we don't want that. We want to be aware of that in those situations that take place. Now, it tells us that they were hidden reefs in your love feast. And they were there without fear. Now, now we all kind of know what a love feast is, now don't we? We can see examples of it. One would be in Acts 2, 46 and 47a. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. That was a love feast. It was communion time, the things that we celebrate today. Now, these people, they would get together and they would have these uh, love feasts. They would get together and they would share food, kind of like a potluck. Now, I don't know about you, but I really love true potlucks. And I remember that in the bigger churches that we have attended, when we've had potlucks, I am of the mind that I personally prefer the women and elders to go first. But most churches that we go to, they always say, no, let's let the kids get their food first so that they're out of the way. But what happens? The kids go up, and by the time you can get in the line, all the fried chicken's gone. <laughs> or all the best desserts, or all the deviled eggs, or whatever you really wanted, it's always gone by the time you get there. <laughs> these kids are like these people. They are the hidden reefs. Now, I'm not saying that kids are horrible and evil. <laughs> I'm really not. But they are just like these people. Because the, these false people came into the fellowship and they really enjoyed these potluck dinners. They ate everything they could, turning the love feast into an opportunity to indulge themselves. They're filling their own bellies. They're not worried about anybody else. They could care less about everybody else. They were only there serving themselves. They were false shepherds and leaders who are supposed to give, but instead all they did was take, take, and take. Now this is not a new concept in Jude's day. It's not even a new one in our own day. In Ezekiel 34, God addressed the shepherds of Israel at that time. Ezekiel 34 verses 2 through 4 and 6 through 8. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, 
Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. You know, I really like Ezekiel. And I like Jeremiah. And I like all those when it sits there and says, prophesy to my people, says the Lord. Prophesy. Here is the same principle in Jude. The shepherds were false, and all they cared about was themselves. They didn't care about the flock. They didn't care for the brokenhearted. They didn't look out for those who were struggling. Everything was about themselves. Me, 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 me. And I know that we have these in the world today. Jude tells us the mark of a false person is that he is in it for what he can get. He won't serve others so that they can feast as well. It's always nice when you can go to a potluck and there's enough for everybody of everything. Jude 1.12b There are clouds without water carried about by the winds. Now this really, when you think about it, you, got, you have to love these Old Testament folks. Even in, in uh, back before that, because all the prophets, all the other folks, they always talked about the things that you could recognize and understand immediately. This is a beautiful use of imagery. Now, we all know, we all know for a fact that water is vital for life in a dry land. And it's exactly what we need. Without water, well, we can't live. And if you remember, rain in the Bible and clouds bringing rain is always a picture of God's blessing from above. Always is. Water is needed for everything that God created. It nourishes life and is the very thing that sustains it. You cannot beat the real thing either. Now, here at work, we use irrigation. We hook up the hoses and we run the pumps and we pump water out of the little creek over here. And it waters the lawn, but it only goes so far. So where the water reaches, it can be really green and the rest of it can be dry and ucky. When it rains, it gets everywhere. And there's just something about rain. I don't know about you, but I can fall asleep to the rain. Especially when it's pounding on my little tin roof. I can't go to sleep to of a sprinkler. It's not the same. There's something that is greater than the water we provide through irrigation that comes out of the sky because God provided it. It's something that he does, that he blesses us with. But false people are like those clouds that supposedly carry rain. How many times this last week did you look outside because the weatherman said, guess what, it's going to rain. And you saw the clouds coming across and they were big and they were black. And you were like, oh, here it comes. And then the clouds would just sit there and sit there and they blow over and no rain came. We look for clouds when it's hot and dry. And we know we're, we'd like to have some, some cool rain. And we look for them. And they did the same thing back in those days. The farmers do it today to save on, on their irrigation. But the false people are like the clouds that are supposed to carry water, that refreshment and life. But they don't rain. They don't do what needs to be done. It's a false hope. 
that takes place. When you need rain in a dry land, you watch the clouds. Sometimes the clouds look like it might rain, but they've got nothing in them. They, there's nothing to give. I don't care how black they are. Sometimes they just give you lightning and start fires. Yeah. And then you go, please, God, let it rain to put out the fires. <laughs> and all they do is just blow across the sky. Jude says false people are like these. False apostles and false teachers that are in the church. They have all the nicest clothes. They have all the nicest positions. And they look like they're going to bring life. And you sit there and you listen and you're going, man, I can't wait to get fed. And then you walk away and you're going, I don't think I was fed. They don't have the ability to bring that refreshment to a dry and thirsty soul. Christians need the water of life. We need the word of life to be continually refreshing us. It's that important. And it brings life into our bodies. But these false people, they have no substance. And they can't help us. Now Jude, he may have been thinking, it's possible, he may have been thinking of Psalm, or Proverbs 25, 14 when he wrote this. Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like the clouds and wind without rain. He could have been thinking that. False people are exactly like that. You think they're going to give you a blessing and they give all the appearance that the blessings will come, but then, no. They falsely boast of giving nourishment, but they don't deliver. Jude also says that they are carried or blown by the winds. Some of these men and women promise much, but they are blown by every wind or the latest trend, trend that comes around. They always encourage their hearers to get with the program or they'll miss out. When you look back over Christian history, winds have come through and people rush to the latest movement. <clears throat> this is one of the things I found interesting throughout Christian history. This is the latest and greatest. Everybody runs to it. They rush over thinking it will bring the blessing. It will bring refreshment to their soul. This is the latest revival. 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4 tells us, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. These false people blow this way and that. And unfortunately, they lead born-again Christians uh, away with them in their wake. They leave the damage. They rush here and there thinking about the latest and greatest. I've got to get this. Many of these things are clouds without rain. They don't bring what they should. The promise of refreshment is not there. They are clouds without water carried about by the winds. Then what does he tell us in Jude 112 c Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Jude goes on to say that they are like barren fruit trees, twice dead. Many fruit trees in that climate would bring fruit twice a year in spring and autumn. These fruit trees bring nothing, no fruit whatsoever when it comes to fruit bearing. And remember what the, what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. When it comes to fruit trees, everything abides in the vine. All we are is a branch, and the only way a branch can produce fruit is because it is connected to the vine or to the root. All its nourishment and all its ability to produce fruit comes from that vine or the root of the vine or tree. The vine, of course, is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. All we are is a branch. I like that. I want to be a live branch. I want to be one that's productive. I don't want to be pruned off and thrown in fire. I don't want to sit there and look all good and be doing nothing. 
but we are in him and the life to produce comes from him. He alone is the only one who can live his life in us and produce the fruit. We abide. You don't see a branch pushing really hard and try to produce fruit, do you? You don't see it out there going, oh, I can make fruit. <laughs> and also, fruit appears. It doesn't happen. If it did, man, that'd be kind of a cool trick. I might have to get me some of them trees. Fruit can only come as we rest in Christ, risen from the dead, but is alive in us now. And John goes on to say, without me, you can do nothing. Without Christ, you can do nothing. We should underline that because it's so true. We can try as hard as we like to produce fruit, but we won't produce anything apart from Christ. The only fruit we can produce is through his life that indwells in us. For without me, he tells us, and we need to know it, we would do absolutely nothing apart from him. False people are barren because they are not connected to Christ. They give the appearance of being a branch in a tree, and they may use effort and push hard to produce, but only real life can come from Christ. Let's look at a couple of examples. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the ungodly. Let's try that again. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. First of all, the perspective is one abiding in Christ, having the word of life in our hearts, delighting in it, meditating upon it. The man or woman of God who does these things will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. There are many times, uh, many times of growth for us as Christians and many times of fruit bearing. But there are also many times in the season of a, of a Christian life. We have what? We have times of waiting. We have times of patience, times of persecution, times of suffering, and times of fruit bearing. Their leaves will not wither when things get hard. For the man or woman of God who meditates on the word of God and delights in God's word, who trusts in Christ, will be planted by the river and the fruit will come. If you are trusting in Christ and you are meditating on that word and you are sucking it up as much as possible, you cannot wither. You will not dry up. And when the time comes and it's proper, you will produce the fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaf will be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Isn't that cool to know? How many times have we experienced something so horrible, and I'll call it drought, and we have our trust, our hope, and our faith in Christ, and those times don't seem so bad? Not at all. You know, because you can look up to the horizon, and you can look up to God, and pretty soon, oh, <laughs> okay, that was just a speed bump in the road of life. No big deal. The one who abides in Christ will be like that tree planted by the river. And he will not fear when the heat comes and will not be anxious when the troubles arrive. You can probably laugh them off pretty easy. All these things will come to us in our Christian life without fail. Yet despite it all, those who trust in the Lord will not cease from yielding fruit. Our calling is to bear fruit. These false apostles and false teachers and, and apostates, they take instead of give. They're like that 
like a tree that is barren, producing nothing. Remember what Jesus did in Mark uh, 11, 12 through 14? On the next day when they had left Bethany, he became hungry and seeing at a distance a fig tree and, and leaf. And he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may you no longer ever May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. It was a false hope. It was an idea. Look, I have everything that's needed for you to come and see, but the fruit's not there. That false person, they require maintenance but they give no fruit. The only thing that's good for them is to be ripped up by the roots because they produce absolutely nothing. It's a waste of space. And Jude is so descriptive as far as the statement, twice dead, when he said that earlier in there. I'm not really sure what he means by that. Maybe. Maybe because they don't bear fruit in spring or autumn. Or it could be a picture of natural man. We're born into sin. And that sin is, and we're spiritually dead alienated and cut off from the life of God. And if he doesn't repent, he's going to die a second time. A second death and be cast in the lake of fire. Now, I'm only making an educated guess here for that. So don't quote me as to being an expert on that one. Because I can only speculate. In verse 13, Jude gives two more examples of the characteristics of false prophets. Jude 1, 13a. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. <clears throat> Jude likens false prophets to the raging waves of the sea. Now, being from the Midwest, we have no oceans. We have the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers. And they really don't produce waves. They do if a speedboat goes by or a skier. But they just flow nice and easy. And the closest I ever came when I was younger <clears throat> to seeing the ocean was the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the Gulf of Mexico is not the ocean. It's not even close. I remember the first time I saw the Pacific Ocean. Up close and personal. I was in my mid-20s or early 20s. And I was visiting California for the first time. And the day was not all that great. It was kind of cloudy and rainy and kind of, you know, icky. But from about a great distance, I could hear something that was loud. That was before I had to have ears to help. But I could hear a really loud noise, and I was asking, what the heck is that? And the folks that I was with said, that's the ocean. And I'm like, no way. We were like three miles away. And you could hear the ocean. I was like, holy camoly. And I remember that everybody laughed at me. They thought I was joking. When we got there, and I was like going, man, look at those waves crashing. It was, oh, it was so cool. It was so cool. And I remember that I saw the Atlantic Ocean. It was impressive, but it was nothing like the Pacific. It was nothing like it. The waves, when they crash, you've seen it. You've been walking on the beach. You've seen it. What do the waves leave when they crash? They leave things um, like a little bit of scum. Yeah. They leave these bubbles, that, and sometimes they smell funky. It washes up on the beach as well and leaves that layer on the sand. And you can go up and you can kind of touch it, but you're almost afraid to because, I mean, I'm not a real big ocean guy. And I'm really afraid of the depths that I can't see the bottom of. I don't like swimming in the ocean, and I have. I've swum in the ocean. But it was really scary for me. Have you ever seen the beach after a great big storm? It's amazing what washes up. 
Jude says that these false teachers are like raging waves of the sea that foam up their shame. Isaiah 57, 20 tells us, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. And its waters toss up refuse and mud. They're big, they're boisterous, they're tossed to and fro, but all they leave behind is froth and scum on the beach. So what is froth? Froth is a mass of small bubbles and nothing else. There's no substance whatsoever. All they're doing is blowing bubbles. It's like the scum on the beach and foam of the waves, just a mass of small bubbles, and they're blowing bubbles. I thought about bringing a little bubble thing in with me and going, and here, and you know, and you know, God is so great. <laughs> I really, I, I think that, you know, that, that God is saying we're going to do blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But then I was afraid you might take me out and stone me. I don't know. <laughs> Jude 113b. They're like wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of the darkness forever. Scripture always links angels with stars. And these false teachers are likened to the wandering stars. Now, this could represent those angels that left their abode and came to earth. It could because, remember, he talked about them earlier. Stars are interesting because they're fixed positions in the sky. And the sailors use them all the time. Before technology was ever invented, they navigated the seas by the stars. Now, I still say that even though they have technology that tells them all this great and wonderful stuff, Last time I checked, they still carry the sextants and everything else, and they use the stars as the backup. They would know the direction to go because the star, most of the stars are in fixed positions. You can't plan your course on a star that is fading and falling out of the sky, the shooting stars. Oh, we've got to go that way. You can't turn quick enough. And if you followed that, to that shooting star, you would be so far off course, it's not funny. <clears throat> now, depending on which hemisphere you live in, you guide yourself by a different set of stars. In the North Hemisphere, it's what? The North Star. What is it for the Southern Hemisphere? The Southern Cross. The false prophets are not fixed. They're like a wandering star. They're shooting. They're moving. You can't fix your position to follow them because they're here one day and they look great. And then they shoot across the sky, ending up in the darkness. And you can't plan your course of life on them. Our faith is set on a fixed position on Christ. That's where our eyes should be focused on him. He's a fixed position. He's not a wanderer. He's not going to pull you off course. He's never going to betray you. He's never going to not be there for you. We fix our position on him, the light of the world. Revelation 22 says that Jesus is the bright and morning star, and our position is fixed on him. Everything is about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his life, his death, his resurrection, that in all things... Colossians tells us he should have preeminence. So give me any man or woman in all simplicity that preaches Christ and him crucified, and then you know you're on a safe path to the heavenly home. If you were to navigate and plan your life based on these false people, then you will be led every which way by every wind and doctrine that comes. But our fixed position is Christ. He is our bright and morning star, and he should be the center of our life upon his death, his burial, and resurrection. He should be the center of our universe and nothing else. He is alive and, and with us now. These other folks, they're wandering stars, whom the blackness of darkness is reserved. Straight away, Jude says these people, they're not going to get away with it. They're not going to get away with it. There is a judgment coming on these apostates. 
and the blackness of darkness is reserved for them. Now, we've experienced that once before in our life. Okay, we haven't. The Bible tells us it's happened once before. And we know that when we read about it uh, in Exodus 10, 21 and 20 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. And they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for the three days. But guess what? All the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. <clears throat> Scripture says that it was a thick darkness which could be felt. I've never been inside of an a underground mine. I've been inside of a cave before. And they turned out the lights. And I imagine the same thing when you're in a mine. If they turn out the lights, it's dark, and you can become very disoriented very rapidly, and your fear will elevate something tremendous. For those who hope in the Lord and trust in the Lord, we will have light. <laughs> we will have light. Those who have been born again and taken the shed blood to their account. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. His sacrifice for you and me, that he might bring us to God. We will have light, no matter what happens, especially in times of darkness. Now, we keep hearing about the prophet saying, darkness is coming. Do you think you're going to experience the darkness? It's only for the evil. It's only for the evil ones. We will have light. We're going to have light in our, our, in our own homes. And we'll be able to look out and go, ooh, that house is dark. Hmm. That one's dark too. Did he go on vacation? Hmm. Think about that one for a while. Don't dwell on it too hard because Christ is our center of our universe. We will have light. If these people don't repent, there is judgment coming for them. They won't get away with it, which is another constant theme in this book. These little itty bitty 25 verses. What is reserved is blackness and darkness forever. It's eternal. We need to be the opposite of this. We are also called to be light, like the light on a hill. Both Daniel 12, 13 and Philippians talk about it. Philippians 2, 12 through 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, uh, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shall shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. Our calling is to shine. You don't want to be a wandering star, one that shoots here and there. You want to be lights in the world as we look at the light of the world. We can only shine if our gaze is upon Christ, the bright and morning star. Paul says in Philippians that as we do that, we will become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you will shine as lights of the world. The Lord Jesus is the greater light and we are the lesser light. We have our part to play. Reserved for these false people is the blackness of darkness. But God's people will always have light in their dwellings. Go forth and shine this week. Let's go to prayer.